Alrighty, we're at 506 or 206 if you're on the West Coast or something 06 if you're not anywhere around uh, the United States. Let me kick this thing off. I think there's been a lot of confusion about HIP 55 and a lot of that comes from how the HIP was initially presented, some of the language that was used in specific. I think some of the most confusing aspects of it were around the POC challenge wording. I think a lot of people interpreted this HIP as challenges will no longer be done by hotspots, but will be done by validators instead, as in the entirety of proof of coverage will be done by validators and all of our rewards will be taken away. Let me assure you that is not at all the case. It's just a very small part, which is constructing the challenges that's moving to validators. So no worries about validators stealing all your rewards. So this HIP is really about hotspots more than anything. Hotspots are the core of this network. Without the hotspots, the network literally is nothing. The whole incentive model is designed to give the vast majority of the incentives to hotspots, and that is not changing. And this HIP is really about making hotspots work better than they ever have. And I can't really say it any better than Helium CEO Amir Halim posted on Reddit. So I'm going to quote him. This is what he said. Reasons to vote yes. No more hotspot syncing and snapshot issues. No more relaying. No more relayed challengers, which you can't deliver your witnesses or beacons to. No more port forwarding or firewall problems. No more SD card issues. Data consumption of hotspots will be a fraction of what it is today. And hotspots will become cheaper due to reduced hardware requirements. Reasons to vote no. 0.9% less rewards for hotspots. So that is Amir's summary, and I think he pretty much nailed it from the hotspot owner perspective. This is going to be a radical change in what it is like to be a hotspot owner. You will no longer have to deal with syncing. You will no longer have to think about port forwarding. Basically, as long as your internet connection works, your hotspot should work after these changes. A lot of the pain of owning a hotspot should go away and the network should just work better. Everything should be much more stable. Now, I understand that people are really concerned with rewards. They see rewards going down. They see the missed opportunity because they ordered their hotspot eight months ago and now the rewards are a fraction of what they were when they ordered the hotspot. And those are all valid concerns. The reality of the token and reward model of Helium is that The tokens that are created each month stay fixed. And the tokens that are rewarded to each hotspot are just the fixed amount of tokens created per month divided by basically each hotspot. Now, there is variation based on how your hotspot is performing, how many witnesses it has, and stuff like that. But long story short, you're splitting the same reward pool with all the other hotspots on the network. So if we have 500,000 hotspots today, and in three months, we have a million hotspots. That means the average reward per hotspot will be reduced by 50%. Now, does that mean that your hotspot will be reduced by exactly 50% in terms of rewards? No, it does not, because there are great variations in hotspot performance and configurations. Some of it is in your control, installing a better antenna, getting your hotspots antenna outdoors. Some of that is not in your control like network issues, which even if you have a perfect internet connection, you've set up your port forwarding perfectly and you have a high performing hotspot, you can still be bitten by network issues and there is nothing you can do. I've overseen a fleet of hundreds of hotspots. It is very frustrating. It just is. There are a lot of issues with networking and those are all born of hotspots needing to connect to the peer-to-peer network. Now, the peer-to-peer network we have on Helium is unlike any other peer-to-peer network out there. There are over 550,000 low-powered devices connected to this one peer-to-peer network. That is a lot of processing for these small devices and a lot of bandwidth. And frankly, peer-to-peer networks were not meant to scale like this. The fact that the Helium network has been able to scale without completely falling apart to 550,000 peer-to-peer clients is incredible and a testament to the engineering of the Helium core team and the effort they put in there. So with these changes, hotspots will no longer need to connect to the peer-to-peer network. Rather, they will refer to validators for things like challenges and beacons and witnesses. 
So the validator is it will challenge the hotspots instead of the hotspots challenging the hotspots. The big advantage of this is that the hotspots no longer need to keep an entire copy of the blockchain. They no longer need to follow the blockchain. They no longer need to be a part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. This just reduces all the complexity in a hotspot in its daily operations by a ridiculous amount. Bandwidth could go down by 90 plus percent. Processing power needed will reduce to a fraction of the current processing power needed. And power consumption will go down as well. So this tip is really all about making earnings more consistent for hotspots and making the data transfer over the network more consistent as a result. At the end of the day, we are all here building a network that is meant to have data packets sent over it. And hotspots will just be easier to operate and will be more stable. And most importantly, the effort that people are putting in to optimize their setups to get a great antenna placement to run that 100 foot wire up a tower that they built in their backyards, that will be rewarded more accurately. That will be rewarded as it should be. Because right now, no matter how much effort you put into your hotspot, you could still suffer from peer-to-peer -peer network issues. And that can really be a bummer, especially if you've put in a lot of effort. There are many people out there who have wasted a considerable amount of hours fighting issues that unfortunately simply are not in their control. And this hip is about bringing control back into hotspot owners' hands by radically simplifying the way that hotspots communicate with the network. So <clears throat> at this point, moving challenges to the validators is one way for the network to scale. It's the only way that I've seen proposed that makes sense for the network to scale. I'm not going to stop and say that it would be the only way for the network to scale. I think there possibly are solutions where there are third party participants, an additional participant in the network that is just a role of a challenger, but that's not what this HIP specifically proposes. And because all of that work is being moved off of the hotspots and onto validators, 0.9% of the rewards that are currently allocated to rewarding challenge creation will be shifted from hotspots to validators under this HIP. Now, this isn't a huge shift. So the hotspots will go from earning 70.1% of the total network rewards to earning 69.2% of the total network rewards. So yes, there is a drop in the share of total rewards that the hotspots should get. However, hotspot performance should be so much more stable. It should be so much better to be a hotspot owner. It should be so much more seamless that you shouldn't even feel this reduction. Now, that's not to be said that there isn't an argument to be made against this 0.9% being removed from hotspots and going to validators. I think there is a very valid argument around the value of that 0.9%. The people who notice this reward most are the people who have set their hotspot up in a completely new location and have no witnesses. These people only receive this 0.9% reward. Now, it's not much, but it is greater than zero. And it's possible that for some hotspot owners, that is the little trickle that keeps them going, that keeps them wanting to keep their hotspot alive and develop their area before they have that secondary witness to massively boost their earnings. Now, this person with no witnesses will earn a pittance compared to someone who actually has one, two, or three witnesses. But it's not zero. And I think there are valid conversations to be had around this 0.9% and what should be done with it. But the way that this HIP is proposing the 0.9% be allocated as of now is for that to be moved from the hotspots to the validators. And I think there is a valid argument there as well. Now, I want to address some of the concerns around voting and how the voting process goes. A lot of you received a notification in your Helium app to be sent to the Helium Vote website. And you also received a notification to watch the previous AMA video that was, that was held a few days ago by the Helium Core team. And for a lot of you, I think this is your first time voting on Helium Vote, which is great. I wanna see the greatest participation possible. And there have definitely been a lot of concerns around what voting means in the Helium community. Ultimately, the vote is decided by how much HNT is put behind each vote, right? So you need to cross a two-thirds threshold, 67% of total voting HNT, in order for a proposal to pass under Helium vote. Now, this system hasn't been in production that long. In fact, the way that votes were done previously 
just a few months ago was something called Rough Consensus, which is where we would all pile into a Discord channel, or maybe only some of us would pile into a Discord channel because most people didn't even know the vote was happening. And we would thumbs up and thumbs down on a message that said, do we approve this? And if there was a decent enough majority that DY decided rough consensus was achieved, that's how the vote was passed. So Helium vote is an attempt to bring that to the next level. But that's not to say it's perfect. Now, the scope of voting in blockchains is beyond the scope of this discussion today. But I just want to say a few things on that. It's a very hard problem to solve to create a voting mechanism that everyone views as fair. And it's very hard to get around certain inherent issues in blockchain voting. So for example, a lot of people have suggested that one wallet should count for one vote or one hotspot should count for one vote. But this is very easily gameable. If you have a lot of hotspots or you have a lot of wallets, you could make the vote seem like a lot of people are supporting something when in fact it's just you with 500 accounts. Now, that's not to say there aren't downsides to HNT percentage being used as what is measuring the vote success either. And it, it does definitely raise concerns of larger voters having a larger say. But it's very hard to create what is called a civil resistant voting system on a blockchain. It's very hard to prove individuals' identities. These are hard problems, and they're not unique to Helium. They are problems that exist in the entire blockchain space. And so Helium has these same problems. We have to face the same problems as a community. And in fact, I think some of the most interesting and forward thinking voting ideas have been presented in the Helium community. And one of those ideas is called HIP41. Now you can go and read that HIP, Google it, or check out the channel in the Discord about HIP41. But that basically attempts to solve some of the issues around centralization of power when there are large HNT holders by allowing the smaller voters to lock up their coins in order to have a basically higher voting power. And this is under active discussion. It may have changed since I last read it, but I think I just want to get the message out there that this is not like the final system that will ever exist. I'm sure we will come up with something better as a community. And I also want to point out that it isn't usually the case that the majority of HNT holders override the majority of users or individual wallet holders. Now, there have been two votes so far out of the seven total votes where the HNT percentage went above 67% and the individual wallet percentage was below, although they were both pretty close. So that was the HIP39 redenomination, and that was also whether to publish the temporary hotspot deny list. Those were 64% and 62% by wallet, respectively. So it's not to say that there is no concern around larger wallets being able to pass votes when in individual wallets may not have voted the same way. It's an active area of research, of discussion, and if you care about this issue, please get involved and advocate for what you think is the best solution. I think you'll find that if you get involved, it's largely open to discussion. And the people who are working on these things genuinely want to come to the best solution that is best for validators, is best for miners, and pleases all the stakeholders in the Helium ecosystem. Miners, again, you're extremely important. The network would not exist without you. So if you have a miner and you feel like you're disenfranchised with the current voting system, please get involved. Let us make this better together. Now, as far as this specific vote, I just want to lay out there that anyone is welcome to propose a new vote. Anyone is welcome to go into the Helium vote repository and submit a pull request. If you disagree with a specific part of this HIP, or you just want to get something on your mind, you want people behind you, whether that's individual wallets or HNT holders, you are welcome to go and start your own movement and open a Helium vote. So if anyone is feeling really upset by HIP55 or by any HIP, I'd really encourage you to just get involved. Go on GitHub, open a pull request, get involved. That is a very effective way to get heard. And I assure you that the major stakeholders in Helium want as many voices as possible to be heard. That is what I've seen from the beginning. So I hope that cleared up some questions that people may have had about HIP55 and about what its actual intention is, what it actually does. I don't expect everyone's concerns to be immediately gone after hearing my explanation. 
And that's why we have this Q&A. Before we open up the floor to questions, I wanna see if we have any manufacturers in here. I, I know we were supposed to have Tim from Long AP. Tim, I'd love for you to say a few words about Hip55, about how Long AP views this change, how it affects you and anything else that's on your mind. Yeah, sure. Just to give a little background, we have been working on a light hotspot for over a year already, because when we joined Helium as a manufacturer, light hotspots were already on the horizon. There were already some plans for it, and we really viewed it as, well, the best solution. And that's for uh, several reasons. I also discussed them today in the HIP55 Discord channel, but I think most importantly, uh, there are two major reasons, and that's uh, CPU usage is way less compared to the full hotspots because full hotspots are really burning all these uh, CPU cycles on validating the blockchain. And that validation is only necessary for a very little part of the functionality that the hotspot is fulfilling. And by moving to light hotspots, all this computation is not required anymore and we can produce much better, much more power efficient, much more lighter hardware. And that means that, well, the hardware can become a little bit cheaper, especially when the chip shortages finally solve, hopefully very soon. And more importantly, it's also uh, very power efficient. And that means that we are now able to make a off-grid device. I know there are people out there that are already doing that right now with full hotspots, but it's very hard at the moment because the power consumption is high. And also the data consumption is very high because as some people might know, especially a few uh, months ago, data consumption could go up to 500 gigabytes a month. And with light hotspot, it will be much easier. And with our, for example, our light hotspots have an embedded 4G modem, and that allows them to fully operate without any wired connection or whatever. So I think it's really a big plus that light hotspots come alive. And also for, let's say, all the issues around network connectivity we're facing today with food hotspots. So Tim, what does this mean for existing long AP owners and owners of other full hotspots that currently exist? What it will mean is that at a certain moment, once we all agree that we should do HIP55 and all the, the, all the code has been merged into production, that will mean that all the hotspots will move to uh, a state where they will function as a light hotspot, which is only actually from the earnings, like you said, a very minor change. And from the outside, it's also a very, a very minor change. So nothing will happen to your hotspot. Nothing strange will happen. But the only thing that will happen is that it will communicate with the blockchain in another way. And it also means that it doesn't have to be port forwarded anymore. So there's no issues with relaying anymore. It doesn't write anything to disk anymore, which is a huge difference comparing to what we see today. Because today uh, we see that, well, the food hotspots are writing their disks full every month or so. And that means that they have to clean and that they have to resync. And it also means that especially hotspots with SD cards, they burn through the SD cards. I saw some, somebody saying we're the biggest uh, SanDisk sponsor at the moment. So I think those are major benefits also for existing hotspot owners. Yes, I've firsthand seen the issue of burning through SD cards and it is bad. The blockchain activity requires a lot of writes to disk and these SD cards do fail and replacing them on a massive scale is not sustainable. It's a very you know, technical process and for thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to have to do this on a regular cycle, which is what would happen if we continued with full hotspots, it's simply not sustainable. Yeah, and just to give a comparison, our uh, full hotspots have a 32 um, gigabyte SSD and our light hotspots, they currently use eight megabytes. So it's not gigabytes, it's eight megabytes. That's incredible. So that means the hardware that can be used for these light hotspots, just to be clear, hotspots that are manufactured in the future, once light hotspots are eligible under HIP-19 to have secure key storage for their swarm key and participate in proof of coverage, the hardware requirement goes to almost nothing. And we no longer have to rely on some of these hugely constrained parts like the Raspberry Pi board. So to give a bit of a comparison, the current hotspots, the food hotspots are almost, let's say, a light desktop computer. Okay, a Raspberry Pi is a kind of a desktop computer. You can run a desktop on it. And the new light hotspots are really compared to, let's say, a router 
that you would buy from whatever outlet for routing your network traffic. That's a really big change. And just to clarify for everyone, all the full hotspots will be transformed into light hotspots via an over-the-air software update. You will not have to do anything. It will just happen. And all of the light hotspots that are produced as simply light hotspots that were never full hotspots to begin with, they will all have the exact same capability to earn from proof of coverage. There is no difference in what your current hotspot can do versus what the newer hotspots can do. So just to clear that up. All right, Tim, I really appreciate you clearing those things up from the perspective of a manufacturer. I'm sure you guys are <laughs> really excited to get building your light hotspots and shipping them to customers. Uh, I want to invite Paul to make any comments. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, thanks, Armand. I'm really excited about this HIP and about light hotspots in general. I've been a long time community member. I had my first hotspot in 2019. I've written my own HIPs that have contributed code to the minor bit code base. And I operate validators. And, and this is, to me, one of the biggest steps forward on the Helium network is, is moving to this new architecture that is really going to stabilize hotspots and make the network perform much, much better. The couple of things I'll add to your intro, I think you covered a lot of really great topics and clarified a lot of things. First is that the HIP55 also included some technical aspects of, of the implementation on the validator side. I think this may have driven a little bit of confusion, right? Really the core of this hit in my mind is, is the vote on, do we move to light hotspots, which involves this small economic change. And again, it, to my perspective, that's a no brainer. I, I think we absolutely need to do that for the, the network to continue to scale. And then the second point I want to add on, on just the economics of moving the that 0.9% is this hit will make a huge difference in the stability of the network. And, and something that shouldn't be lost is that when the network performs better, more HMT is mined every month. When there are halts on the blockchain or slow blocks, HMT production is actually lower than the target. So hopefully this stabilizes the network in general. We'll try to meet that HMT minting target more often. And I think rising tide will lift all boats here and everyone should benefit from this. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. When we have those slow periods and the minting goes down, those are coins that simply will never be created and will never be rewarded to hotspot owners. And this hip is a huge step towards making that never happen again. There's no guarantee that it will never happen again, but it is going to be much easier to avoid a scenario like that in the future. So it's interesting to do a thought experiment and look at the data. I'd love someone to crunch the numbers to see if that 0.9% that's being moved from hotspots to validators is possibly made up for in the fact that the amount of HNT produced and rewarded will actually just be higher overall due to better network stability. It's quite an interesting thing to look at. All right, so we've got three hands up. I'm going to invite up God of Thunder. Welcome to the stage. How you guys doing? I'm an off-grid miner, so me personally, I love this hip. It's going to bring my expenses down for data for the internet and make me drive up less to replace my SD cards because yes, that does happen. So in my opinion, I think this hip is going to pass. Uh, so my first question is when it does pass or if it does pass, when do you guys expect to have it rolled out? I, I just want to clarify that I'm not on the Helium core team. I see Cox is here. I'm happy to answer. So. That's a really good question. The software update, when will that make it onto mainnet? And so right now the software is being tested on our test net. We started our testing process workflow by using software miners. And we're now moving to original Helium hotspots that are running this new software on test net. And I think next week we're going to start inviting different manufacturers to load that software so that they can make sure their hotspots can do this new way of proof of coverage and receive challenges for validators on testnet. Once we have a good sense of everyone participating and this new light hotspot software working as expected on our in production hardware, assuming this hit passes, we will slowly merge it to mainnet and not activate it. So this is the same idea that we had for POC 11. It just gives us more confidence that this new code will be successful on the first try. When we activate it, everything will transition nicely. And so the timelines for that, uh, so next week we'll encourage makers to start testing. 
we'll probably have some undetermined amount of time for them to soak in this test. And then from that, we will merge to production. And a couple weeks after that, we will activate those set of chain variables for HIT55 and light hotspot software to work on existing full hotspot hardware. Fantastic. Thank you guys very much for all the hard work and everyone in the community and hope to see you all around. Thank you, God of Thunder. And I just want to tail on that, which is that God of Thunder mentioned doing a remote deployment that is backhauled by 4G or LTE. I know there are a lot of people out there that have done these types of deployments in the past. And as the network scaled up, they actually are no longer able to run those deployments because they simply use too much bandwidth talking to the peer to peer network. They're getting kicked off by their providers because they're using too much bandwidth, 100 to 300 gigabytes a month. So Theoretically, these changes, if you take into account the fact that there might need to be software updates over the air, they should bring things well under one gigabyte per month of usage per hotspot. And that should not go up either as the network grows. So this is a huge boon to people doing off-grid deployments. Yeah, that's going to change pretty big how I pay for the uh, internet providing services. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. Optimus Prime, you've been waiting quite a bit. So welcome to the stage. For those who have made the capital outlay for the more expensive original hotspots, are there plans to make use of that higher end hardware once light spot hotspots become the norm? That's of course a good question for the team. There's no plans that I'm aware of, but doesn't mean that they can't be used for something for them. Certainly understandable. So you spend all this money and Raspberry Pi is quite a formidable almost even desktop computer when you compare it to when it first came out. So it does seem like a shame to have a lot of these hotspots with a lot of compute power available, not doing anything, but there's nothing currently in the chain that can use that power. If anything, I would say it'd be great to have more advanced radios in the future. That said, we're open to ideas. The nice thing about light hotspots though, is when they do deploy, even these, this heavy duty hardware, the CPU usage is going to go way down and the, the bandwidth usage is going to go way down. I did want to talk about the actual bandwidth usage that I've measured on some of the hotspots I own. Now, almost across the board, syncing with the chain takes continuously 190 kilobits uh, a second, 24 hours a day. When you do that math, you do come up with hundreds of gigabytes. Possibly I should do the math. <laughs> But when it comes to moving to a light hotspot bandwidth usage, it really should be less than a kilobit a second, maybe even 500 bits a second on average. It's spending most of its time waiting to be notified of state channel changes. And when it does pick up a packet from the air, it's going to be transmitting those across. Those are 24 bytes to maybe 52 bytes. Very little bandwidth. So really, the metrics on how much bandwidth it's going to be is going to go down by 100. The power usage, even for your heavy duty hotspot, should come down as well. A typical Pi right now on the chain consumes about five watts to follow the chain. I suspect that could maybe drop in half to two watts for a Pi, even if it's a full hotspot going into light hotspot mode. So short answer is no plans to use that extra compute power, but it's not being wasted. The power consumption should go back down. Alrighty, thank you. Okay, Rath, I'm uh, inviting you up next to speak. Hey guys, appreciate you bringing me up here. I just have a quick question about like on the monitoring side of things, like basically right now there's already a limited share of vendors out there that even give you any kind of diagnostics whatsoever. And so it's been pretty apparent that the hotspots that don't have diagnostics tend to be a lot harder to troubleshoot for certain things. And the ones that do, you tend to find that there's a lot of errors that could be prevented by either the user or there's just things that they didn't recognize like the ISP change and IP address. And, and so those kinds of things are apparent on hotspots that do give this kind of data. The ones that don't, we typically just use things like challenge receipts and creative challenges to be able to say, Hey, you are definitely in sync. Even though it says you're in sync on the blockchain and you have another dynamic, we can see that you're clearly making some kind of progress here because you have created challenges and you have challenges that you're, that you're actually pushing up to other uh, hotspots as well, right? So the idea what I'm really trying to get at, is there a way that we're going to be able to measure the performance of these hotspots, is there any kind of thing that we're going to do in the future that even hanging vendors basically pass some sort of, of a test that we as a community come up with that says, hey, you have to have at least these minimal required diag pieces and some logs or something like that so that we can follow and, and be able to, you know, report as hotspot owners the problems that we have in the field. It's definitely a great question. I'd love to invite somebody from Helium Core up to answer that. My minimum answer is that if you're right in that Things will definitely change. 
there will not be challenges constructed to be a heartbeat of a hotspot on the network. And it's unclear to me. I, I did read some code in GitHub recently. It seems like there will be a connected status at the very least for light hotspots, but I'm unclear as to what the exact mechanism is there. And certainly introspection is going to have to happen at some level in person or over a vendor's specific diagnostic tooling if you want to get the most detailed information, just like right now. I could jump in. So there's a couple of interesting things that was mentioned. One, using challenges, specifically challenge creation is a heartbeat. That's right. We've had to do that just to even know that the hotspot was in sync. That's not needed anymore since these hotspots don't need to be in sync anymore. So what do they need to do? They need to be able to reach out to validators that are on the network. They need to be able to make HTTP connections out. So, you know, no more relay on the way out. You, usually most firewalls, even like home firewalls and even sort of whatever setups that you might have in your house or on, you know, some CG NAT that might be sitting on some mobile network, you know, doesn't really block the outbound or doesn't have like specific port limitations on the outbound. So essentially, is this thing able to connect to the internet and is able to connect to a validator? Is really, is this thing online? After that, it's really about being targeted. So if, if your hotspot is being targeted, it needs to be able to connect to a validator and that validator needs to inform it when it connects to it that, hey, you're being challenged right now. And so that that's the like sort of frequency of, of challenge E is probably the thing that you're going to be monitoring. And is it approximately even based on the number of challenges that are available on the network? So one of the technical changes that are being made with this, the validators are creating challenges per block. And so that's essentially how you know that you're going to be challenged. And there's some specific details of how challenges happen in the HIP, but roughly speaking, validators are creating those challenges. So I think that's like from a, do I have this thing connected right perspective? The things to really pay attention to are going to be, is this being targeted? And am I participating in, in witnessing? And am I transferring data for devices? Those are going to be your heartbeats going forward. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Rath. And thank you, Hashcode. I will be inviting up Phantom next. You've been waiting for a while. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. So firstly, I want to say that on the surface, this makes a lot of sense. However, as a voter who obviously has uh, helium in my account, that means I've been mining. And if this proposal would make it so light hotspots are as good as the ones we currently have and the manufacturers won't be making the high powered ones. They'll be making the, the light hotspots. It seems to me like the light hotspots would flood the market a lot more quickly and lead to all of our rewards going down. Why would we vote for that? The goal here is to build the network. And if the network can be built more cheaply, that is fully in support of that goal. So. Our end goal here is to create the most widespread coverage to pick up data packets that are transmitted by real world use cases. And if we make the hotspots cheaper, that is a boon to that goal. And ultimately more hotspots on the network raises the value of the entire network. Now I'm only gonna speak on this for a second because it's not something we discuss here, but the value of the network going up is basically what is meant to compensate that. And by that I value of HNT going up now, this is based on a lot of things, based on market conditions, but theoretically, if we create a more valuable network, that dilution will be at least in some way offset by HNT price appreciation. And that is all I'm going to say on that. Do not want to get too deep in, into that realm because that's not what we talk about here in this Discord, but it is an important part to acknowledge of the helium flywheel. So long story short, if you have a full hotspot right now, I think one way to frame it is that You've been able to get higher HNT rewards because you've been an earlier participant in the network. And those people who are participating with light hotspots will, at the beginning of their experience with the network, have even more diluted rewards than you were ever able to get. So that was the early adopter price that you paid for getting a full hotspot. But at the end of the day, reward dilution, although it's not favorable necessarily on the on, its face for individual hotspot owners, if that reward dilution is incentivizing more hotspots and is making the network more ubiquitous, 
that is strongly aligned with the goals of the network. I might add to that a little bit, and some of the manufacturers might be able to uh, jump in on this too. Uh, there's still a significant number of people that have hotspots on order. That's not really slowing down. We've been averaging uh, just under 100,000 more hotspots per month. Rewards for proof of coverage is going to continue to decline regardless of light hotspots or not. Yeah. And there, there are definitely unfortunate scenarios that people get into where they have entered a purchasing relationship with a manufacturer who has not delivered in a satisfactory time frame, and that's you know, that's a symptom of the market. There, I know that there's a lot of upset people that is unrelated to this hip, and it has a lot more to do with supply constraints and the circumstances of any given manufacturer that you may have ordered from. At the end of the day, this is a cutting edge new thing and there are constraints and there will be people who will not have the most favorable experience and of course none of us want that to happen but it's just the reality of uh, what can happen and personally i've been involved in this network for over two years if i look at my hotspot orders the first one i waited six months next one i waited seven months and the next one i also waited six months this is not something new there have been long waits for as long as helium has existed and that's just you got to accept it unfortunately yeah, I was just going to comment that I don't think we're going to see the prices decline immediately because because of some of the supply chain constraints and the fact that there's a backlog of demand. But over time, definitely, we should see that come down. All right, excellent. Joe P, you're next up. You've been waiting a while to speak. It will be interesting to see how manufacturers price their light hotspots that are using much cheaper sort of components. I'm interested to see how that goes. Uh, Joe P is taking a while to accept. I'm gonna also invite up Pro Slasher to the stage. Welcome Pro Slasher. Thank you. So I wanted to quickly ask how the validators will be picking which hotspot to challenge in the scenario of a CG NAT or where you have a large university campus where there might be 10 or 15 hotspots deployed across a campus that spans 20 miles. How will the validator determine when they all share the same public IP which one will be receiving it? Because currently we can use VPNs to get around that limitation. So what would be the scenario for that specific uh, situation? That is a great question. So in the new light hotspot architecture, the hotspot to validator communications will be outbound only. So imagine your hotspot pinging a validator directly and asking, have I been challenged? Have I been challenged? Have I been challenged? There is no longer a component of having any sort of inbound connection from other hotspots or other validators. So this new light hotspot design completely eliminates the problem that you're referring to. But then that also opens it back up to the basement scenario where you have to have reminders in the basement all sharing the same public IP. So how, how those two counteract with each other at that point? Yeah, so if I can jump in on how things work today, and they'll be largely the same. The challenge is selected randomly, but there is some seed based on the state of the blockchain. So it's not, you can't pick whoever you want. The validators will pick based on a determined formula for which hotspots is being validated. Actually, they pick a X, which contains a bunch of hotspots, and then they challenge an individual hotspot within that. That's going to stay the same under the, the proposed HIP 55. And we're still selecting a X that is um, randomized. So it's not that uh, validators can select whomever they want. And if you have multiple hotspots on the same IP address, it's not going to give any advantage or disadvantage. I guess I'll invite the, the Helium team who's been thinking on the solution a little bit more to, to comment further, but it's going to largely be the same that it's randomized first target hacks and then, then you target a hotspot within it. Yeah, I might be able to answer that, but Procesha, let's go through that a little bit more. So you're under the assumption that the IP address of the hotspot has something to do with whether it gets challenged or not. Is that right? And what do you remember of that? I remember the Bloom filter was introduced quite some time ago. I also remember that if you are CG net, you don't have a reliable NAT connection necessarily, so you can't get an inbound connection in the first place. Yeah. Uh, I understand it's outbound so, now, but previously you and I specifically talked about the logic where they have the other, right, where they're all relayed and they're basically, does it pick from that or not? Yeah. That has to do with the, the Bloom filter part inside the challenge selection, I, I think that actually was dumped or it's going to be going away because IP address it really has almost no meaning in the system. And what's going to happen is every light hotspot maintains a persistent connection to a validator. And validators will probably share amongst themselves an idea of which hotspot is where, <laughs> who's connected to which validator. And when you need to contact a hotspot to challenge it, notice will go out over that persistent channel that the hotspot is keeping open. And again, the targeting will be purely about where the hotspots asserted 
and nothing to do with its network connectivity. So in this university scenario you're talking about, I've got 20 hotspots deployed around the university. They may be sharing one network connection, but each of them will have an individual connection to the validator. And on the blockchain, their asserted locations should be correct. This is what something we encourage everyone to do. And based on their location and who else is in, that hex will come up randomly during the network selection process and the hotspots in it will be chosen randomly. And as long as they can be reached, the, the system should continue to function. So the real question is, is that Bloom filter still in place? And I doubt it. And if it is, it's definitely going away because it won't make any sense at all. P2P just doesn't exist. Yeah. Doesn't and exist. I think it was, it was designed to target a certain type of gaming and cheating on the network. Now that we have the denialist in place, the, the, the temporary solution until um, HIP 40s voted on, you know, I think it alleviates that particular type of um, gaming should be covered by the denialist as well. No arguments there. The VPN also allows people to remotely manage them for uh, sense apps yeah. and bot gets. So there is still use case even afterwards, but the point that I was trying to make sure of is that the other piece was like, they're, they're all going to be receiving the challenges from the actual validators. The other question comes back about the validators. What if one's failed or what if the two that I'm connected to do end up failing or going offline? How do I still receive any activity at that point? Will they automatically roll over to the next one? You get some of the design that's, um, in progress and being tested on testnet right now. The proposals that have been put out there is your hotspot can prefer a number of validators so that you're right, there's no single point of failure there. And then even potentially down the road, the option to select preferred validators. And even what I've seen on testnet is that the light hotspot software lets you put multiple, right? So it can go through a list and, and find one that's available. So as I just, a lot of you probably know, I've done a lot of this as a strong recommendation least to make sure that you do have geolocation for the validators so that when I'm here in Atlanta, I'm not connecting to a validator base in China with that two second thing. Basically, there should be some sort of a geo shaping so that the traffic is going to a local validator if available. And if not, go to the next nearest node. Okay. Hopefully that request is heard. You could definitely imagine that being done. It's pretty easy to imagine picking the validator based on the lowest ping. So I don't see uh, why that wouldn't be done. All right. A Nick poor. I don't know if it's Nick Poorman or Nick Poorman, but just to be as kind as possible, I'm going to say Nick Poorman. Please come on up. Welcome. So I think the work that's been done on this is amazing. I just want to preface that I'm fully in support of all of this because I break distributed systems for a living and I'm seeing the pain points and I think that it's a great solution. I think that from a temperature check of the community and some other communities I've been that have been discussing certain things around this, the point that keeps coming up is centralizing a lot of stuff into the validators. I think the spirit of the white paper was amazing. You read through it and you're like, okay, I can run this edge device. I'm a miner. I can get going. And a lot of that is being back to the validators, which have a very high barrier to entry financially. And I totally understand the purpose of that as well. I'm wondering if there's anything on the roadmap for allowing lower barrier to entry validator roles, something that isn't as critical, but people that say wanted to run maybe a lighter validator instant could do that without having to stake a fee that's cost as much as a house right now, which is right. Only going to increase as the network becomes more popular and HMT prices go up. Yeah, so I've hung out in the validator channel quite a bit, so I can at least partially answer this question. The cost of 10,000 HNT was chosen pretty early on. Uh, it was intentionally a, a somewhat high barrier at the time, although as you've mentioned, it's become much higher. You don't want to have too many validators on the network. Right now, even we have like over 3,000, which is much more than actually most proof of stake blockchains out there. So lowering the barrier of entry strictly would drastically increase the amount of validators and start to bring back some of those peer-to-peer -peer issues that you're seeing from having so many hotspots on the network. One solution to this is partial staking, like Helium Rising and other vendors are offering, where you could come with some smaller amount of HNT and receive, for a very small fee, a percentage of basically interest based on the validator staking APR. Now that's not ideal because it has to be custodial, the only non-custodial solution is to have 10,000 HNT validators at the moment. So that is certainly a hip that could be written. There has been discussion about maybe having delegated validators where you could delegate any amount to a validator, like in Solana, for example. But 
there was a myriad of solutions here. And th there's also been discussion specifically with HIP55 of having a new role, which is a challenger, simply a network participant that's not exactly a validator, but creates challenges and does nothing else and gets that 0.9% reward. I don't know what the proposed ideas for designing the software are there. It would definitely be an increase of complexity, changing the software to add another type of network participant. But those are the solutions to that problem uh, that I see. And I think as I mentioned in my monologue at the beginning here, this is one of those problems that is not inherent to Helium. I think you got at this too, is that this is just a blockchain problem of how do you make things as fair as possible while also ensuring network security. It's a, a hard problem to solve and something that I think a lot of us would like to see more hips and more discussion around. There has been some discussion that there could be a validator role that just acts as the, the gateway service provider for hotspots. They don't do the block production. That idea floated around a while ago in the, the validator channel. It's, it's something that could still get legs. I think it's a it's an interesting challenge though. As Armand mentioned, 70% of rewards go to hotspot owners. That is drastically different than other chains where the majority of rewards go to validators. So it, it is a pretty small pool of rewards going to the validators already, which is over time going to put a lot of pressure on the, the return. So the incentive for people to operate and operate with high performance validators. So yeah, definitely potentially opportunities there. It's also a pretty interesting challenge to try to solve for. I thought it's great. I think everyone appreciates that you guys are looking into possibilities there, especially different world of lighter validators. Thank you. D-Man, did you have something to add there? Another question from Waveform, another one of the moderators asks, if challengers are taken away from a lone wolf, does this mean that the owner cannot now transfer the hotspot to another account in the future unless it beacons or witnesses? Or will the hotspot transfer rules be changed? Okay, so I'm, I'm just reading uh, another channel here. So it appears that the answer to this is that transfer v2 does not have the block requirement anymore, <clears throat> but the app still does check even if you do a transfer v2. So transfer v2 is the new type of hotspot transfer where there's no payment and it's a one off, right? The person who is transferring the hotspot can transfer it directly to the recipient without the recipient having to also countersign that transfer transaction. So although it is a requirement to have activity within the Helium app and it does some client side checks, assuming for foolproofness and to prevent scams, the blockchain itself does not actually prevent transferring of light hotspots in this way. I'm going to invite Wrath back up, who is requested to speak again. Is there any thought around or anything that's going to be done about DDoSing? Because I can already see that could be a problem with the only 3,000 validators, right? They're now servicing 500,000, if not more, hotspots on the network. It would be really easy to crash that whole system. We already have the problem now with API, right? Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything around DDoSing that's going to be taken into consideration. So on the DDoSing thing, I'd definitely invite any uh, Helium Core contributor up here to answer that better than I could, but I'll, I'll do my best. I follow various validator communities, and by various, I'm pretty much <laughs> Helium and Solana because they're very active and very interesting, but it is a real problem. And having an open port on any machine definitely makes it susceptible to some level of denial of service. So I see hash codes up here. I'll pass it off. I think, Armand, I think you had the right start there. One of the things that's interesting is definitely that, yes, there's 500,000 hotspots today, well, let's say 2 million hotspots in, in a couple of years, all doing effectively read-only requests against validators. The thing about the way that we're moving forward here is that this is, these are essentially HTTP connections and they're outbound and they're unary requests, they're one-off requests. We have have 25 years of experience of how to scale HTTP, how to deal with GET requests and everything from load balancing to, to caching. To, there, there's lots of like prior art here. That's really what I think we should be taking advantage of as a community. This is actually an opportunity to get off of uh, a very particular protocol around the P2P. We don't need to worry about DNS because we, or, or at least registries and, and name services, because there is such a thing called DNS. There is such a thing as load balancing and, and things like that. So there, there's a lot of experience out there of how to, to manage that. That being said, we still have distributed uh, denial of service attacks happening in the wild, and many other chains have dealt with these as well. I think we just, we need to, we need to build. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, if I can hop in on the, the DDoS problem. The one that Hashcode alluded to, I think, is more around the scale of requests from light hotspots. And I think his answer was excellent in that regard. The, the other one, and I put a link in the voice chat to this withdrawn HIP number 34, which was proposed a couple months ago. And it was specifically referring to securing validators against DDoS 
because there is, a, in fact, a financial incentive for other validator operators to essentially knock their competitors offline and reducing the number of validators overall would theoretically result in them earning more rewards. So it's actually not necessarily a new problem, although as far as I understand, it hasn't really been observed in the wild. And so Light Hotspots doesn't really change it, but it is still an open issue. And I'd invite anybody who was interested in this and some of the solutions that have been proposed to potentially revive this hip or propose a new one. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I remember seeing that proposed a while ago. And back then, I think validators are quite new and there wasn't a lot of thought going into this, but this new development of HIP55 and having a new open port for validators to receive remote, essentially RPC requests, raises this issue in a more salient way that, that has something concrete attached to it. So yeah, HIP34, go check it out. Pro Slasher, did you have uh, another question? Yeah, this came up from the voice chat text channel. Just want to make sure I understand validators correctly. Can I deploy four copies of the same validator in different geo redundant areas? I don't know the answer to that actually. Yeah, hash code. No, you definitely don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, but, can I just send up a, a general warning? This is the worst idea I've ever heard then, because if there's no geo redundant, uh, see with the validators, that means if one single validator in a single location goes down, all those hotspots are going to the next nearest place or any other place. Unless you have a validator that can be running across multiple cloud environments and in multiple environments with uh, a geo redundancy, that means that validators will lose the ability to participate and provide coverage for the blockchain because of the specific I, limitation. I understand why, but yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm trying to understand the reason why you bring that up. So it, maybe there's a misunderstanding on the role of validators here, but I'm just trying to like parse the reason why you're saying that. I, I agree that if you are a hotspot, and, and you have, let's say, five validators that you're configured to connect to at any time, you want to have redundancy. And if the one that you're using as your primary for source of blockchain data goes down, you want to go to the next one or the next one or the next one. So that, that's true. Could you maybe explain a little more? Do you remember the AWS outage that happened, I think, at the end of last year that took down almost everybody's smart home devices in the United States? So at that time, the only environments in AWS were actually overseas that were available. Some regions here did actually receive some traffic, but most of the other regions were actually in other countries. Similar things have happened at Azure too. So without you guys allowing the keys for these validators to be put into a central store, such as an Azure key store or the one for AWS and allowing multiple instances of the validators to be able to access that and have geo redundancy, when those validators go down, any hotspot that's connected to it, will have to go find a new validator and create a new connection. You're going to have 5,000 hotspots on a single validator, potentially one instance running, they're going to go find a brand new validator. Additionally, it doesn't allow people to run smaller instances and geo redundant instances so that West coast, East coast, that's a 230 millisecond ping in the United States. So I can't go deploy a validator on the West coast in us one and deploy one in us East two and have those local hotspots going to those locations for the validator heartbeat. So now you're introducing a ton of lag for no good reason. I understand that this is currently the current world we live in when we have hotspots in London, challenging ones in Brazil, for example. Yeah. I totally get that, but it's going to be the same, if not worse, when you have everything going to a single point, which is a single instance, not a clustered instance, not multiple instances running and sharing the same key, like on a scalable stack, it's one single instance that they're redeploying and changing the, the variables for. It makes very little sense to continue with that until that's fixed. I think, again, let me just clarify something that I think you might be getting wrong, which is that the reason why a hotspot reaches out to a validator Primarily, it's asking for data that's available on chain. It could ask any validator for that data, right? So there are 3,000 validators. It could ask any of those 3,000. The second reason why it might reach out to a validator is in order to deliver a witness receipt. And so it, it's reaching out to a validator that is operating the challenge at the time and delivering that witness receipt to that validator, who is also the challenger. But yeah, so if the challenger goes down, and this is possible, it would, well, let's say it's running on AWS and the challenger validator goes down, it is now not performing POC activities for, for that POC. So that's correct. But all other functions of the network still operate. But it also depends on where the miner that is being challenged is located. In Atlanta, and I've already seen the logs, I will have 280 receipts for a single beacon that's sent. And so 280 for a validator times the scale of 500,000 or even a smaller amount, you're going to DDoS yourself for, for no reason, really. Two things I'll, I want to mention really quick, Peter, to res respond to that are, first of all, you can run a mirror validator and spin up a replacement, which a lot of 
providers do, although that wouldn't necessarily, I don't know how that might work with the address books that are going into the light hotspots, but yeah, more could, importantly, we'll do that in a second, but yeah, keep going. Um, more importantly is I think remembering not to make a perfect being the enemy of the good and how much that this is already a problem. And it reminds me a lot of even the rollout of the validators, which is not necessarily a perfect solution but is certainly better than when consensus was being run on Raspberry Pis. I'm sure the team would not, is listening to the feedback and the idea of design improvements, but I, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for not doing something at all just because it's not as good as it sh could be. I'm not disagreeing with you. This is better than what you currently have on that single front. If we look at it, a holistic approach, if light hotspots are this cheap to create, and the idea is that they're going to be quickly deployed and cheaply deployed across the entire world that quickly. And, and you have no concept of load balancing on a transaction receipts, for example, or for issuing challenges or even for the heartbeats for that matter. If you have no, no concept of load balancing for that, and it's just based off of which validator is currently available, but there's no way for these miners to know, you're just going to have miners continuously pinging saying, hey, are you available? And that's what's going to happen. So either A, the person with the biggest hardware is going to, to win the, the transaction effectively, which could be the case. And that could actually be the case in the distributed environment, but that's still helping encourage people to build out the network in a scalable environment in the first place. So without that load balancing concept introduced to here, you're going to be introducing your miners DDoSing the validators. So I think the load balancing point is a good one. You mentioned that you have a hotspot that might have 280 witnesses to be able to deliver at any time. They're not delivering it to a single validator. They're delivering it to the 280 validators that are dealing with that challenge. So that is like by nature being distributed. That's still and not I, load balancing. That's a round robin approach. What I want to ask hash code is, is it possible that ProSlasher is overestimating the amount of load that each hotspot puts on the validators? Because I know, for example, you could easily serve 50,000 clients on a 512 megabyte web server. So how, how big is the actual load from the hotspots here? Is it the case that most likely a single or two or three or four validators could probably handle all the hotspots on the network if they truly had to? That's not my concern is that I can get 10 gig connection for hundred bucks and I can send a lot more traffic than these hotspots can. That's my concern. And we don't have a concept of load balancing. We don't have a concept of like a CDN basically for these transactions that can handle these things. Yeah, and I think one thing that I will take from what you said there is that is the value of proxying, the value of load balancing. You know, what Jamie mentioned, there's a couple of different kinds of failure cases that you need to think about when you're deploying systems that take on a ton of traffic. I used to work for a search engine and a payments company, so I, I have a lot of experience dealing with that. So, you know, the kinds of things that you have to deal with is being able to spin things back up very quickly in case of catastrophic failures. And then also being able to handle a horizontally scale that happens as you have just regular traffic, right? Not just catastrophic failures. For the catastrophic case for validators, Jamie is right. You can store your swarm key. You can have a hot spare ready to go. And what happens there is that if you restart a validator with a swarm key that's been stored, that'll come online. It'll inform all the members of the peer book here. Here's my new IP address and here's my new port. And then validators will start to uh, send traffic towards you there. And that's also how a validator might be addressed by a hotspot going forward. So if you have a catastrophic failure, that's generally what you do. And that's what validator operators I think are doing today is that they have their swarm keys backed up and they're able to either do hot standbys or they have to resync and, and come back up to speed again. So that's what I would do. And I think that's what most validator operators are doing today for catastrophic failures. As far as load balancing inbound connections, look, I'll definitely take your point. You're right that it's something that we need to understand and characterize. And I think that's work to do. And I mean, feel free to reach out to your ask it if necessary, but effectively, if, again, I think what should be done before this is even considered to be put into production is that the swarm keys are moved over to a secure storage credential provider, aka Azure, or Azure Keystore, for example, is the one I'm familiar with most. And then you're allowed to run a validator on scalable instances, a containers that can scale and that can be deployed across every different region if necessary and share that same key. That's yeah, and how the system should be done before it's deployed. Because otherwise you have a single instance with a single key. I get that they're backing their key up, but that to your point, IP address and switching over to DNS and the propagation to the network can take hours to days sometimes. It depends on the DNS updating. Sure. And that's one of the reasons why 
an early version of the validator the sort of description included like you'd have to report your DNS name. And so then it's whatever is behind that DNS name. It's on you to figure out how to do load balancing or, or maybe switching the, the thing behind it. We decided to not do that to reduce complexity of the initial validator release last year. Look, I, I think it's an interesting idea and it's definitely something we should consider. I'm, I'm not sure if it necessarily needs to block deployment of this. I think we, we can probably show the impact and we're already seeing this in testnet in, in some ways we're essentially spinning up thousands of, of fake hotspots against uh, our testnet today. Then we can, we can also see what this looks like going forward as well before this is even activated. But your point is right. There is probably some value of interacting and, and understanding with like what this looks like in the future. Like I said, feel free to reach out. You guys have a good one. I do think someone should give that man a grant, help harden yeah. up some validator setups. Also, it's been amazing watching the validator community kind of swarm around technical solutions uh, to problems like this. I like the pun. Yeah, it's the validators have done amazing work helping each other run things. I think that my only criticism of validators is I'd love to see more incentives for validators to update their software quickly, but that has not a lot to do with this discussion. So I'll keep it shut on that point. All right. I think we have had a lot of great discussion. I really appreciate the technical discussion that just happened. I think for any of you who are listening in who weren't really grasping exactly what was being talked about there, maybe it was a little technical. I think the point to take away is that the design proposed in HIP55 is a start. It is not the end. It, it is a proposal of how to get the network into a much healthier state as soon as possible. And there can always be improvements. So just like I said at the beginning of this call, the HIP process is open to everyone. I think all of us would love to see more well thought out hips. There are so many bright people in this community who have relevant skills and DY is there ready to fund grants. So if you have relevant technical skills, if you really care about this network, which I'm assuming you do, if you're in this call, please either write a hip and or apply for a grant. If you think there's something major that can be improved, we could always use more engineering talent going towards hardening this network and making things more stable. So please get involved. And if you are not a technical person, but you want to rally around your technical people and your people who are writing hips, please get involved with voting. Helium.vote or heliumvote.com, they both go to the same place. The HIP55 vote is open for, let's see, the next three days and 16 hours. That will <clears throat> vary a little bit based on the block time because we're doing blocks, not clocks for voting here. I see there's been about 1,800 votes I hope once we post this audio, that participation will go up a little bit. We've seen thousands of votes in previous voting sessions, so I'm sure we can get well above 1,800. And as far as the percentages right now, it's about 93% in favor of HIP55 and 7% against HIP55 in terms of HNT. And if you do the math on the number of voters, it is about 62.4% of individual wallets that are in favor of this proposal. So I really hope we can put this out there and have everyone come to a more clear understanding of what this HIP is actually about. I think there was a lot of confusion in the community. I had to disable comments on the uh, initial YouTube video that I posted, which was the previous recording of the light hotspots, HIP54 and HIP55 AMA, because I think there was just like significant misunderstanding about what this HIP actually was. And I think that gave a lot of us clarity about the fact that we need to come back and answer people's questions. So thank you everybody for participating in this community AMA. I'm looking forward to having more of these in the future. I think they're a lot of fun and I love that everyone can sit here with us and just learn and, and ask questions together. So thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.